والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم مثل الذين ينفقون اموالهم في سبيل الله كمثل حبه انبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون ويخلق ما لا تعلمون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Peace and Allah's mercy be upon you and welcome to Universal Quran Alhamdulillah wa salat wa salam ala rasulillah all praise belongs to Allah alone. We ask for His blessings and peace upon His Messenger and Prophet Muhammad. The Qur'an is a universal revelation from Allah Almighty, the one God creator of the heavens and earth, to all humanity of every place and every time until the Day of Judgment. There are problems though with many people understanding and then implementing the Holy Qur'an. There are doubts which they have even about the concept of revelation. There are many people who claim, for example, they believe in God. They believe there is a creator of this world. And so they believe that, that following the creator leads to happiness and satisfaction and doing good and avoiding evil. But they have a doubt about the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to convey a revelation to humanity. Well, there's simply one example of people who even existed in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu even in that ancient day, they were almost just as modern as people are today in many of their attitudes. And they doubted that there was such a thing as revelation at all, or that Allah had ever sent prophets and messengers or revealed scriptures. The next difficulty is that even people who believe that Allah has guided people and sent them messages or information through prophets and messengers, they have a doubt about the fact of the Day of Judgment, of the resurrection of the body from the dead, the human beings will be standing before their Creator and judged according to their lives here on this earth. Once again, people today often think that's a modern concept. They think it's only recently that people have doubted matters of faith and religion. And it's not true. But even in the time of the Prophet Muhammad the people of Mecca rejected the idea of life after death. Currently, in Universal Qur'an, we're studying from the 29th section of the Holy Qur'an, Juz Tabarak. And this section, revealed in the early days of Mecca, concentrates on these two principles. Uh, the existence of Allah and His attributes, and the fact that He sends revelation and guidance to mankind, and that we will have a resurrection and a judgment. And so, our actions and our choices on this earth are important. They matter and we have to be aware of them. And the way to know whether our actions are good or evil is to refer them to the Qur'an and refer them to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Today we'll be reading and uh, uh, interpreting from chapter 75 of the Holy Qur'an, Al-Qiyamah. And because it is one of the early Meccan revelations, it concentrates on these basic themes which I've just pointed out. In fact, its name Al-Qiyamah means the resurrection. This, when people arise, literally it means to rise up from the graves and stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One more point before we get into the reading of the Holy Quran is that the Quran was revealed in the Arabic language. So we have to be careful to study it in its original language, to learn it as much as we are able, as much as Allah gives us the power and ability. For that reason, we have uh, Ustad Adil, who is from Egypt and is a reciter of the Qur'an and a, a graduate of Imam Muhammad ibn Saud University. And he will provide us and share with us his excellent re recitation from the Holy Qur'an in Arabic language. And our brother Tahseen is also a student of Islamic knowledge in Egypt who uh, comes originally from Florida in the United States of America. He'll be doing the English interpretation of these verses. So we're going to start out with chapter 75. I'm going to ask Adil if he can read uh, 1 through 6, please. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة أيحسب الإنسان أن لن نجمع عظامة بلى قادرين على أن نسوي بنانة بل يريد الإنسان ليفجر أمامه يسأل أيان يوم القيامة Thank you. I seek refuge with Allah from Shaitan the outcast <clears throat> in the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful I swear by the day of resurrection, and I swear by the self-reapproaching person. Does men think we shall not assemble his bones? Yes, we are able to put together in perfect order the tips of his fingers. Nay, he desires to continue committing sins. He asks, when will be this day of resurrection? Thank you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this chapter with... Uh, an exclamation, la, a negation. What is he negating? He is refusing and rejecting those people who have a doubt in the Day of Judgment. There are two things that people may doubt about the ability of Allah to resurrect. That Does he have that ability? Does he have the power to do so? Or would he do so? Does he have the will to do so? Has he promised to do so? And both of those are rejected clearly by evidence that we can see and understand with our minds as well as by the statements of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Quran and in previous scriptures revealed to previous prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah categorically rejects that anybody can have a doubt of the uh, ability of him of Allah to raise the dead or the need for Allah to do so. The ability that Allah will bring us proofs and evidences of his ability and power to do as he will. And so anybody who believed in God could not reject the idea that God would not be able to do so. And secondly, the need for him to do so, which is that if you rejected that Allah would, would need to bring us back and judge us, then you're rejecting the idea of Allah's justice and fairness in punishing sin and rewarding good conduct here on the earth. And so without a belief in a day of resurrection, it's a negation of Allah's ability and power and everybody in every religion who understands the concept of God understands that he is all powerful by definition he has the power to do whatever he will otherwise he wouldn't be God and if they doubt that he wants to or has promised to resurrect the human beings then they're doubting that uh, Allah is fair and will judge and will establish justice so people will get away with evil and they will never be punished and people will do good and they will be harmed in this world and they will never have any recompense or any reward for their good deeds. And so both of those things are showing the ignorance of the people who would reject the concept of the resurrection. It's impossible to have religion and a belief in God without having them. And so people who claim to be religious but not believe in life after death or heaven and hell are really having an incorrect concept of religion, an incorrect understanding of Allah's perfect attributes and his superiority of his power and his justice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rejecting that idea and then he is making a statement uh, that he is swearing, that he is calling into witness as he does aspects of his creation to show his power and his ability. In this case, the day of resurrection itself. Now how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call that into witness? Because it's something that is clear and uh, indisputable and therefore nobody has the right to dispute and argue and reject. I've stated before, but I always have to repeat for any new viewers of the program, that swearing by the human being, swearing an oath about something, is only done in the name of God, in the name of Allah alone, because He is, he is our Creator, and we have the, no power over anything in this world to call it into witness. We couldn't call to witness of the truth of what I'm saying, I swear by the resurrection, because we have no power to bring that forth. But when we swear by Allah, we're saying that Allah is my witness. If I'm true, He will reward me. And if I'm telling a lie, Allah will punish me for that lie. So as an act of worship, we only swear by 
Allah alone. We don't swear by the prophets or the angels or any human being or anything in the creation. But Allah calls to witness anything of His creation that He desires uh, because He has the power to do so, to bring them as witnesses to the truth of this revelation of the Holy Qur'an. So this first verse was revealed in response to those people who doubt the resurrection. And then he swears in the second verse by the self-reproaching soul, al-nafs al-lawama. This is very important because it's an aspect of human psychology. The Day of Judgment, resurrection, is a concept we have never witnessed, but we believe in. And we can understand it mentally through thinking, through reason. But it's not something that we can be personally a witness to until death. But the self-reproaching soul of a human being is something every single human being is familiar with. Any person who's ever had doubts, any person who's ever changed their minds about something, any person who's regretted something they did or said in the past, it's part of an aspect of this self-reproachment that we know we're not perfect. Even if we don't admit it, in our hearts we know we've made mistakes. Any person who was born a child who knew nothing and gradually learned, by learning, first of all, you're admitting that you're ignorant, you didn't know things, and then you learn new things. So every human being, since every one of us was born from a mother, we were born as a child who knew nothing, and then we learned gradually. Every one of us had things we didn't know. Every single one of us, think about it. Every one of us has changed his mind about something. That means we thought things were true, and then we found out later on they were not true. And so we develop and grow. And so we say, oh, if I had known then, would I know now? Oh, how much better it would have been. But that is the nature of the human being to grow and develop. And so we regret that in the past I knew less. In the past I did things that I would not do today. Because now I know more, I have developed. And all of that is by the grace of Allah that He has allowed us to develop and grow to, inshallah, our maximum potential if we will only make an effort. So then how can I reject the concept of a resurrection, that everything is going in stages and Allah has brought this, us from death and ignorance to life and knowledge, then we'll be back to death again. Then it's easy for Allah SWT to bring us back to knowledge. But knowing that, even though it's a hard concept for people to understand, knowing that you have imperfect knowledge and that you have made mistakes in the past, how can you reject something just because you haven't seen it personally? How can you reject something which is a logical concept? There is no proof that there is no day of resurrection. There is no proof that there is no life after death. But you haven't seen enough proof to be convinced 100%. But why would you reject it? When you have to admit within yourself that you have learned and you have changed your mind and you have doubt, doubted things and then you learned they were correct or you believe things and you learned they were false. So you cannot simply reject something which you have not seen because you haven't seen it. But you have to admit that even though you don't know for sure 100% today that there is a day of resurrection, that tomorrow you may learn the answer. And so it's foolish for any of us who doubt themselves, even a little bit within themselves, to, to reject something simply because we haven't seen it before our eyes. And none of us, of course, will see it until the Day of Judgment. Al-Hassan al-Basri is one of the early scholars of Islam. He gives some comments. We'll go to a break. We'll come back and we'll read his comments and other comments of the scholars about this verse uh, after the break, which is Akum Allahu Khairan. <laughs> Quran, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the Most High spoke the Quran. It's the thing between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are we given the rights of the Quran? Are you ready to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day of judgment for the Quran to take us from our hands to the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we go through every verse in the Quran to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? Watch for the TV. Quran in depth. Welcome back to Universal Quran. We're reading from chapter 75 of the Quran, Al Qiyamah. 
Before the break, we read the first two verses of this chapter that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling to witness the fact and reality of the resurrection that people will come back from the dead and be judged for the kind of lives they've lived here on the earth. And in verse 2, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us into account that within our souls, every human being is self-reproaching. They blame themselves. Uh, they blame themselves for things in the past that they did or said. Al-Hassan al-Basri was one of the second generation uh, scholars, one of the senior scholars of Islam from the second generation of Islam. And he notes that this is the person of faith. The person of Iman, the person who has faith in his heart, always reproaches himself. That he says, now why did I do that? Why did I eat that? What was I thinking when I was saying the words that I said? But the person who has faith always sees that he's less than perfect and would like to improve. Because we don't measure as a Muslim, a sincere Muslim man or woman, we don't measure ourselves on the level of human beings. We measure ourselves according to Allah's laws. And Allah's laws are perfect. But none of us are truly perfect. And so we never quite measure up 100%. Uh, the Sahaba were the best generation created by Allah. Allah gave us not only the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's blessing and peace be upon him, but he caused the Prophet Muhammad to be uh, in a generation of people who could hear his message and live it fully, who sacrificed everything they had for that message. And they were truly the best generation of Islam, and no generation since then will ever be up to their standard. And yet every one of them used to worry about his own self. Am I a hypocrite? Am I a munafiq? Because they knew that they were not living up fully to Allah's desire, Allah's will. They didn't mean by hypocrite a person who has no faith and only pretends to be a believer. But they meant by that that they thought things, they had the wrong intention. You give charity and, and maybe you're hoping people will see you or hoping for people's praise. Or you know that you can pray, but uh, say, uh, not an obligatory salat, but a uh, an extra salat, like the late night prayer, but you get a little bit lazy and neglect it. Little things that sometimes people wouldn't think were such a big deal. The true hypocrite would not even want to, for example, give charity at all, not to pay zakat at all. And so if nobody sees him, he'll pretend that he paid it, but he won't pay it unless he's forced to do so. But the believer will say, why am I only giving the minimum? Why, do I ha why don't I give more? I could help people with more, but they always blame themselves. You know, I could do better, but I'm not doing quite as good as I could. They pray a lot of prayers, but they could do better. They fast the minimum plus extra days, but they know they could fast even more. And so the true, sincere person is always having self-doubts. While the sinner, the real hypocrite, never blames himself. He thinks, oh, I'm great. I don't need to pray. I don't need to fast. Allah already loves me the way I am. He made me wealthy. He made me smarter than everybody else. He made me look better looking than everybody else. So I don't have to do the things that these foolish uh, believing people do. And so the true sinner, the true hypocrite, doesn't blame himself like the, the real believer does. So it's a sign of faith. When you feel guilt and you feel that you blame yourself for things you've done, actions that you've done, that's a sign that you do have iman, even if you may not be perfect. So when, when you start to feel you know, that you're not living up to your standard of Islam, that's a sign of your faith. And you need only to be very, to, to carefully grow your faith by good deeds and you'll become firmer and firmer in belief, inshallah, with Allah's help. So, um, the tafsir of this verse about a nafs al or the self-reproaching soul, is that the human being who blames himself is the believer who has a conscience, who blames himself for not living up fully to his beliefs. There's another tafsir, another interpretation of this verse, and both of them are correct, but that everybody on the Day of Judgment reproaches himself. Even if you li lived your whole life at, in Islam as perfectly as you can, when you see the reward for your deeds, you'll say, why didn't I do more? I could have done so much more. Here I am at this level of Jannah. If I would have done a little bit more, I would be even higher. And of course, the unbeliever will be reproaching himself, why didn't I believe? Why didn't I do some good works? And of course, even a believer who is in the lower level of paradise will be happy with where he is at. But he said, why did I do these sins that canceled out so many of my good works? I did so many sins that canceled out my good works, I could have been even at a higher reward in Jannah. And so everybody on the Day of Judgment 
is also a self-reproaching soul or person. In verse 3, Allah SWT says, Does man think that we shall not assemble his bones? Does a human being think that Allah SWT, who created him from dust, created Adam from dust, and created Eve out of Adam, and created every human being out of microscopic uh, 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 sperm and egg that no human eye can even see without a microscope, does, is it not possible that Allah SWT can bring back the atoms if they have been scattered to the four corners or assemble the bones no matter where they're at? There was a person of, in the days of old who felt guilty for sins that he had done and he willed to his children that they burn his body and scatter it on all the different corners, four corners of the world. So because he was afraid of Allah SWT that he would resurrect him. And so he thought that by doing that, Allah would not be able to resurrect him. But Allah easily told us that he's able to resurrect that person. And then he asked the person, why did you do this terrible deed? And he said, I did it out of fear of you. And so Allah said, your fear, because of your fear of me, then I will forgive you your sins. And so Allah SWT is able to take, even if, even if a body is cremated and the ashes are scattered throughout the world, he's able to bring that back, every single atom, and recreate it. In fact, he's able to recreate the atoms. Even the memories within our brains, wherever or however those things are stored away, imperfectly in our brains. Sometimes in our life we forget things. Sometimes we get to a point in el- older people who have, who have uh, diseases where they forget all the, the past deeds. They forget about their early life and forget even simple things. But Allah SWT will bring all of those memories back to us and we will forget nothing, but it will all be brought back to us and restored perfectly and Allah has the power to do that no human being has the power and none of us even understand how that's possible but we know that with Allah SWT, all those things are easily possible so in verse 4 Allah says not only are we able to bring back the bones we're able to perfectly assemble the tips of the fingers the fingertip is one of the most delicate parts the most sensitive parts of the human body in fact the fingertips are what make the human being unique in being able to write and use tools and develop civilization through the use of the fingers. So our fingers are very, very sensitive. And in fact, our fingers contain, of course, our fingerprints, which we know today are totally unique to each individual. Each individual has a, a perfectly unique fingerprints. But when even in the time, early times, Arabs could look at the fingerprint and see those delicate little signs, the delicate little lines, and they knew that it was very delicate and very very precise, and yet Allah can not only bring you back exactly as you are, but down to every small detail. There is nothing beyond the power of Allah to do. Rather, verse 5, the human being does not do so, rather, not because it's impossible for Allah to do so, because he knows very well that Allah who created him can easily bring him back. Not because Allah shouldn't, but he knows that Allah should bring people to judgment bring people to justice, and they will admit that. But they, des- they reject it because they desire to continually do commit sins to live in a wicked life. The human being has a vain hope. They hope to continually live, do whatever they please, whether it's right or wrong, good or evil, clean or dirty, continually do it and not be held accountable for it. That's the one reason why we reject it. We don't reject it because our hearts say, no, it's not possible. But every human heart recognizes the idea of life after death. And, and all the different religions and all the different prophets have taught this. It's a universal desire of the human being to have a fulfillment of this life. The human being develops to such a great extent. Think of the great scientists and the, the people who've done great actions, even outside of the prophets and religious teachers. They've done such great things and then death cuts them off. What if the greatest scientists and the greatest leaders in the world lived on and on and on, how much more would they accomplish? The human being can keep developing and developing higher and higher levels of knowledge. But it's old age and death that cut cut us off. The animals aren't like that. The plants aren't like that. When a plant blooms, it reaches its perfection in this world. When an animal reaches adulthood and reproduces, that's it. A horse can't develop beyond the perfection of what it is now. But the human being is unique and it can continually develop, change the world, build, change the environment, do things to change the world and make it a better place or, unfortunately, a worse place. That the animals and the plants don't improve the world, nor do they uh, cause any harm to the world, but they just live in total 
uh, in a total uh, harmony with the world. But the human being has this huge potential that is never met. And so the human being, if they were granted eternal life, could keep developing. But it is death that cuts us off. And so the human being, death is a waste. And it's the wisdom of Allah to bring the human being back to life, to bring a fulfillment of this creation so that everything which is not possible in this world as we know it is possible in that next life. So the innocent who suffer will receive a reward that causes, fully eclipses their suffering and the guilty who prosper will receive a punishment that totally eclipses all the pleasure they experience in this world. So the human being has a, a vain hope. Even the human being who has a bit of faith in their heart or belief in Allah, they hope that I will be able to continue living the way I want, having pleasure, doing what is haram or what is forbidden, and then before the day of judgment, I will repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I see the angel of death, now it's my death, oh, I repent to Allah. Or I will pray to whoever, I will do whatever, and then I will say, La ilaha illallah, there is none worthy of worship except Allah at the last minute. But of course, once they see the angel of death before them and their, their spirit is out of the throat, it's too late. They can't repent at that time. So that is a vain hope. The true hope, hoping in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is believing in Allah's promises of reward and punishment and living your life according to Allah's reward and punishment, according to Allah's promises, and therefore living the good life here on earth now, repenting to Allah and living according to the instructions of the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the human being leads himself to sin, saying, oh, I've got plenty of time. I'm a young guy. I'm still young. I'm 40 years old, but I still have time. And they, they delude themselves with a vain hope, and then death comes to them when they least expect it, and they're cut off, and they have no hope, because the, this is the time of action. This is the time of decision, and at death that ends, and it's only now the time of reward, of, of recompense, reward and punishment in heaven or in hell. So in verse 6, they ask, this person with this vain hope, asks, when will this day of resurrection be? This is the questioner who doesn't really believe in it. He's not asking, when will it be? Because that knowledge is no benefit to the believer. The believer doesn't care if it's tomorrow or in 10 years or in a million years because the believer who believes in it will act accordingly now because he knows he's being judged. Allah is watching him. His deeds are being recorded and he will have to give account for every small deed in this life. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this, wor- this verse, in this chapter, Al-Qiyamah, is teaching us of the reality of the resurrection that is beyond doubt. We don't need to know the time of it because we have to act accordingly now. May Allah guide us to the belief in the Qur'an and the following of His Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وترى الجبال تحسبها جامدة وهي تمر مر السحاب صنع الله الذي أتقن كل شيء إنه خبير بما تفعلون مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون ويخ...